Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Newman live stream. Um, my name is Adam Hartzell. I'll be your host today. And uh, for those of you who might be new to Nomen, uh, maybe it's your first time filming and tuning into the stream. If you caught the reel that we were showing uh, at the beginning of the stream today, uh, you can see that Nomen is actually a 3D art school. We're located in Hollywood, California, and we specialize in training artists for uh, careers in games, uh, film, animation, visual effects, and so forth, uh, which is some of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, if you're in need of closed captioning, uh, we do have that available as a service through our Facebook uh, feed uh, that's happening right now. So if you're in need of that, uh, my colleague is going to drop a link to our Facebook uh, live feed in the chat so you can head over there. Um, but with that, guys, uh, let's jump in. I'd like to introduce our guest today, uh, Aliva, uh, Alina Ivanchenko. Uh, who is a 3D character artist at Moon Studios. Uh, so Lena was born in Moscow, Russia, uh, where she received classical art training. She taught herself computer graphics, and shortly after university, she began her career in video games as a 3D artist. Uh, in pursuit of this career path, she moved to Canada in 2012, where she's been working on AAA and mobile projects ever since. With over 12 years experience in the industry, Alina feels comfortable working on a multitude of art styles, from realism to stylized, both in 2D and 3D. Her works were selected to Spectrum, uh, Exposé 12, and 3D Creative Magazine. Uh, and she is a frequent guest at, a, at CG events uh, all over the world. Uh, so with that, I just want to say, Alina, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Actually, such an honor. Um, Namon uh, is like one of the uh, well-known um, VFX school, I think, in the world, all around the world. And I even want to start with some anecdote. And I was just starting my first job. And I basically, as you mentioned, I've self-taught in computer graphics. I met a guy from Ukraine, and he was be like, be like, well, I saw these amazing tutorials. Have you seen them? And there's something from Nomon. Like, I think mm -hmm. it was on my painting, something. And I was like, wow, you can learn actually online. I never heard about it before. It's like, it was like a huge new thing for me that there is somewhere, because there's no VFX school in Russia back at that time. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Some yeah, and thank you. That's and you're right. I think most people, a lot of people out there, know Nomen uh, through our uh, workshops and tutorials, which actually yeah. started uh, before there was a lot of that stuff online. It was actually started as DVDs that you could order um, and to have sent to you. Um, and um, what a lot of people don't know is that we kind of started as a brick and mortar school, and um, the workshops kind of came up uh, together in a similar. Uh, similar time. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. I think um, that's what I love about doing the live streaming as well as so many more artists from around the world can get access to Nomen, uh, can have the opportunity to hear from artists such as yourself, which I know for myself, when I was self-learning, it was just a really big deal to be able to hear from a professional in the industry doing the work, uh, their perspective and how they do things. So yeah, it's a pleasure to yeah. have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah. So I think you're going to be, and I don't want to take too much on uh, what you'll be sharing, but you're going to be showing us a bit of some of the different um, types of things that you're using 3D software, uh, like ZBrush, uh, to create, and some of the different um, types of industries or application that you can apply your artwork to. Yeah, something like this. So agenda mm -hmm. for today is just to cover a few ways so how you can use ZBrush in the industry. Uh, coming from video game industry, I will start with uh, talking about how you do uh, character mm -hmm. using ZBrush. And then we're going to talk a little bit about 3D printing. And we're going to talk a little bit about ZBrush for illustration. I hope it's OK. And I just, I, I still, I'm still nervous about it. And I want to mention the not going to go into great depth. So it's basically very simplified version of what I'm doing, but mm -hmm. just to give you like impression how uh, CG works, how I how the game's done, I don't know how 3D printing is done. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess uh, let's get started, right? 
Yeah, and um, any of you guys who have questions for Lena, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, we are monitoring the chats on all of the three platforms we're streaming on today. And uh, I have a colleague who's going to be sending questions through to me. I'll do my best to raise those in context with what Alina is sharing about. Um, and if we don't, uh, then we'll use some time uh, towards the end of, uh, of the stream today to do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but just, yeah, just to echo what Alina was saying, today is more intended to be a higher altitude look, sort of a broad look at some of the different ways that Alina is using um, ZBrush to create art for games, for 3D printing, and other applications. Um, so yeah, probably fewer questions today about poly counts and retopo retopology and <laughs> all of that stuff. I'm still going to um, mention it. I'm still oh, going to mention it. Oh, great. OK. It. How but could you not, like, right? How could you not mention like, it? Like, we'll see. Like, um, I, we might have some questions from auditory, and they probably might give us a hint what they want to know more about. Right, mm -hmm. because I have no idea. Like, uh, what do you guys know? I've been told it's for beginners. So, for somebody who's looking, uh, choosing a path in the industry, and just like trying to figure out if this uh, thing is for them altogether. So, I, I will try to convince you that this is probably for you. Yeah. yeah so, um, I oh, have sorry, my answer. Question. One question came in really quick. Yes, this will be available as video on demand. Um, you can go if you can't catch all the stream today or you want to go back and rewatch it, you can catch it on Noman's Twitch channel as well as our YouTube channel. So yeah, I'll jump in the sidecar now. Alina, you've got the you've got the floor. Um, go ahead and take us in. OK, so um, I have my portfolio open. And I just, um, it's just for beginning. Um, and we're going to start with um, uh, how to use a brush to create characters or uh, video games. So I'm going to use this guy as example. Uh, so you can see from my portfolio, I am gravitating more towards uh, Starlight stuff, more cartoony stuff, Disney kind of things. Uh, so uh, it's not particularly that most of the game are. Like most of the game uh, right now is like realism and a lot of details and a lot of texturing. This thing is simpler technically, but difficult in a other way, more difficult in an artistic way. So uh, I will start with that guy. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about my latest project and even more stylized stuff. So that guy, it was done for indie game. That never happened, which often happened. But um, this is the final model. It's already paused. It have like a stand, and it's in Marmoset viewer. But this is how it started. So uh, if you're curious how characters for the game made, they start uh, usually this we start in our work in ZBrush. Once we have a concept art coming from pretty artist, the uh, first block uh, initial shapes in ZBrush. And the character is usually in symmetry. And most of the time, if it's a humanoid character like that guy, it's in a weird T-pose with like, uh, hands spread and legs kind of spread to easier to create texture and to easy to retopologize with. So, this is how, this is what I have in, had in ZBrush. And like you can see if I zoom really close and I'm uh, gonna show you my wireframe, which is this polygons, because I don't know how, how much in depth we should go, but like 3D models usually consist of polygons and depending on uh, what you're working on, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, it could be like from very high to very low. So this is the wireframe. It's really, really dense, and all together, this uh, character is like um, it doesn't then show up right now. But it's uh, I, I, last time I checked, it was over total polys is over one million. And then what we do is usually we take it to 
another software like more traditional uh 3d software like 3d max or maya in my case i do use uh topagon for retopologizing so what we do is we creating this um what we call low poly low resolution low count polygon um and why this is needed uh back in the days when engines was really crappy um a high a lot of polygons could really make your game like stand still like uh it's it would overwhelm your uh, hardware right now it's less of a problem but still if you want to animate uh to animate character you need like certain position of vertexes and polygons like for example and ages i'm talking about these loops you better to have these loops than your animators and your uh, riggers gonna love you okay uh so this is the next stage and what you do usually the next stage is you go and bake your texture. So bakers could be very different kind. Um, uh, for this particular guy, I think I bake it in 3D Max and I only use this initial coloring, like this poly paint, and a um, little bit of ambient occlusion maybe. So no normals, but usually people like those days, even for stylized model, people do use a lot of textures like normals, like uh, reflections, like emissives. I don't know if it should go into that depth uh, for the beginners, really. But yeah, and then basically after that, uh, oh, sorry, I have to go. Uh, using low poly and using final texture that you create, uh, you just pause it. Well, I, I pause it for this example, but uh, usually it's, uh, it, it, uh, animators do their animations and then it's all go into the engine. So yeah, this is final. You can see the texture, how it looks like. Uh, it sometimes looks a little bit funny. And this is a wireframe. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, the other example I want to show is actually from my latest project, uh, which is uh, Ori and a Veil of the Wisps. We have this cute frog here. And um, uh, I'm going to show you the final, final uh, 3D. And you probably will be surprised because it's, very low res it's like tiny tiny little frog i need some time for this to be loaded so this is a tiny frog it's very low res it's basically why frame is that simple and this texture is hand painted only so it, there is no normals, no any other maps, it's just one diffuse, and this is pretty much it. Okay. Um, so, um, usually some, like, not usually, but historically, some people who do uh, hand-painted textures, like, especially just before the year, I guess, 2005, uh, a lot of people just start work in traditional software like 3ds max and then they just painted it and it's it done and um, if you're only working with the color the map the diffuse map uh the brush is not really necessary but uh i was always advocating for use usage of this brush because for me uh, to block the shapes, to figure out the volumes, because like you have a flat concept, and to make sure I, I have everything all righty, and my 
uh, future model. I prefer to to do like quick sketch in ZBrush, even if it's not necessary in production. So I do usually have it. And yeah, and then I uh, do retopologize it as well. So basically the same process, although I'm not going to open it this file for the frog. Uh, and then uh, and then it's done. OK, uh, then, yeah. Do we have any questions? Or I can continue. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Oh, OK, great. Um, yeah, we did have um, one question, I think, come in that's relative to what you just showed us. And um, people are wondering how, I mean, we see ZBrush used quite a bit for character art, obviously. But um, you also had some environmental elements in the sculpt uh, with the prog. And uh, people are wondering, how often does ZBrush get used for environment art? Um, all the time. So okay. basically, this brush is uh, standard for uh, video games right now. I, I remember maybe five times, oh, sorry, maybe five years ago, I would still see uh, job descriptions where I would like mention this brush occasionally, but right now it's pretty much a standard. Let me open uh, this thing. So this is an environment, uh, actually, re the real kind of environments, the realism style. Uh, and um, for example, this trash bags was actually a combination of a marvelous designer and Zed brush and this uh, uh, garbage with stones is uh, basically done in Zed brush, retopologized, and then um basically put in the engine so yeah absolutely this is cool. a standard you can't avoid it if you want to work in uh, um, video games right now so do you find that uh if something is a little bit more organic in its shape or something to that effect then definitely zbrush and then use some of your other other modelers for things that might be more hard surface or or you know a little bit more boxy let it like a building or something like that Um, well, let's say that, like, um, for, uh, like, m even, um, okay. Uh, so basically, it's not only organics. I, I <laughs> would strictly oppose if somebody would say it brushes for organics only. No, mm -hmm. obviously. People were doing, like, great hard surface with it, and uh, you can you can check Furio, for example, Furio Tadeshi portfolio. Uh, Chi Wang, I hope I didn't butcher their names. They're great. Uh, you can find them uh, uh, presenting on the brush summits mm -hmm. um, of the past. And uh, the guys is just killing it in terms of hard surface. Yes, uh, sometimes it is more than it's more primitive modeling, like. Uh, basically, like let's say the rod and uh, like the wall. Uh, maybe you don't need it, but even for those uh, like the cloth uh, tents, I did use marvelous and that brush. Like mm -hmm. you really like you you. It, it's so convenient, and it's not like you can't do it in 3ds Max. Yeah, you can, but. Uh, what I love about it, brush, you can concentrate on artistic side. And don't think about vertices, polygons, technical side. You just control the shapes, control your art, and then you can do the technical side. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of people don't realize that you can actually you can do some great hard surface modeling in ZBrush too. I've started using yeah. ZBrush more and more for mechs or weapons or things like that. It's it's really great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, I just, I'm not. I'm, I'm not somebody who is really good in hard surface and zip brush or hard surface and uh, somewhere else. So I can I, I can show you an example. But yeah. All right. We just had a question come in, uh, wondering if you work with UDIMs often, um, and if you do, uh, how are they usually laid out for your characters and creatures? 
What? <laughs> oh, they want to know if you work with UDIMs. Do you? Uh, UDIMs. Uh, U D I M. U D I M. That means no. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Uh, Very good. Uh, well, I, I I guess um, I will make complete idiot from myself if it's, if it uh, something from ZBrush <laughs> actually. Sure. But this is a funny thing. I've been working in ZBrush starting from 2007. So unseen times for some of you. And uh, first of all, I still, I, I frankly think I don't know uh, a half of the, the function that Brush have. And um, um, yeah, I, I because I, I'm doing specific, I, that's something I specifically prefer. I prefer gunnings, I prefer mm -hmm. uh, characters. Um, and you even can probably notice that I haven't upgraded to the latest version of ZBrush. It's 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 not it's for some uh, technical reasons, not because I didn't want to. So maybe if it's something in the new version, I also missing it. But uh, I'm gonna upgrade it like maybe next month. Sure, and and you you even said it. One of the one of the great things about ZBrush is it's so vast. There's so many different things you can do. Um, very few artists that use ZBrush know everything there is to know about no. ZBrush. Uh, so, and, and that's an advantage because you don't have to learn the software from the ground up. You don't have to learn every single feature. You can get yes. in and use it for your artistic purposes. Um, and yes. I think that's a misunderstanding that a lot of new people have. They'll open up ZBrush and go, oh my gosh, this is so different. But you can get started pretty quickly. So this is one thing I want to mention. Yes, absolutely right. What in, in what you just said. First of all, um, um, this is interesting. Even like some friends of mine who've been hardcore um, Max or Maya users coming into ZBrush, or somebody who only worked in Photoshop before, and so this interface is so uncomprehensible. I don't know how to use it. Why it's so difficult? For me, it always was very natural. Once you kind of get into this uh, logic and you figure out your pipeline, it's really easy. Like, first of all, like you can, you can see my interface. It's all customized for my purposes. Mm -hmm. It's like so easy to customize. And um, once you figure out what you need, what function you need the most, and you put them on your screen, and you put some of them on the hotkeys, it's like like your workflow is just like two times faster. And yeah, you like uh, frankly, this is what I, I often see in people, and also they like uh, somebody who do jewelry, for example, and they just like only know organics, like they only working in organics and never touch like anything that like about um, uh, hard surface modeling. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I, I hope I could. I kept my face. <laughs> no, no worries. We've got a related question uh, come in uh, about you know how long does it take to learn ZBrush on the level that is acceptable for employers in the game industry? And I think I'll I'll just add to that. I think it depends on how you're doing your learning and how much time you spend uh, learning. You know, each day or each week. But for you, I think you'd mentioned you're self-taught. Um, how did you find um, learning enough at the beginning that you could you were employable, and then obviously we all we all continue to learn as we're working. It actually depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I know people like first like it depends on two things. And depending how um, how how motivated you are, and the second is. Do you have um, artistic background? Because people who already, for example, are good in drawing, for them, uh, like jumping into 3D using ZBrush is like no brainer at all. It's like a few months and they're really good in making 3D. Maybe not on it, all the technical complications like uh, topology or baking, but mm -hmm. just producing uh, sculptures, they are like, they are really great. And then there is like an aspect of like uh, figuring out it brush technically. It, it really depends. Like if you're motivated, if you really want to spend, and also like how fast you learn, right? Uh, 
uh, but for me uh, it always feel natural it all, for me I think I did get into this quite fast uh, after like a couple of months of training I was already doing some armor in the brush uh, for work and um, maybe even less uh, so it was like very fast mm -hmm. and you were building that on top of a traditional art training. but yeah i yeah. like yeah i have a traditional training but uh, uh like technical side of things is quite fast also basically i need to mention that uh, right now um you can go on youtube or you go, can go to pixel objects at classroom and there is insane amount of videos video tutorials most of them free that mm -hmm. can actually help like i've been taught by my colleagues like when it's, it would be like um oh we know this a new cool feature we're gonna show you and this is how how i learned but yeah right now it's way more accessible mm -hmm. absolutely and um let's see someone I, we're kind of on a chain of questions here but someone wanted to know since you already showed it the fawn character that you showed at the beginning the first character you put up um they, they just said hi lena i love your work um they're curious to know if for that character if you textured it in another software or if you used poly paint in zbrush uh i use poly paint i bake this poly paint in uh 3 mm -hmm. um uh, so I bake it and then diffuse. Let's open it again for a second. So um, let me open that. Uh, so um, this is one thing that make like my demo is a little bit complicated. So uh, when you're working on real, real word stuff like this mm -hmm. it's pretty straightforward it, like this is basically uh if you uh, know the technical side is no brainer for um, stylized stuff uh there is a thousand way of how you can do uh a stylized character sometimes it could be uh diffuse only sometimes it could be like normals and other maps uh sometimes it could be hand painted so for this guy, I have my poly paint. I bake it in 3ds Max. I maybe with my bake, baked ambient occlusion, maybe no, I don't remember. But I have like I also installed some light from the top. So it kind of have baked lighting inside. So it's not uh lightened by uh external lights in the marmite set. Maybe a little mm -hmm. bit, but not much and then um um i got one diffuse there's no normals nothing just plain diffuse i guess it's 2k and um, um the, the topology so you can do that but i for for i think most of the game right now still games use um normals and they use like a set of maps for stylized uh, characters this is kind of old-fashioned style style of doing things but i have to say that um for example ori is hand painted ori in the blind forest the characters are hand painted mm -hmm. and i think they look great so although uh hand painted texturing is kind of failing out of favor uh, in a recent decade i still think it, you, you could achieve like great things if you know mm -hmm. how to draw yeah yeah and i love that you're showing stylized work because i think there's a lot of artists out there that are really they love almost that 2d animation style um but uh maybe people who are new to it don't realize is that even a lot of this stuff this content in you know obviously a game is going to be in 3d but say uh, animated feature um they're using a lot of 3d and a lot of geometry to get that look um so even if you want to make something that looks 2d 3d is a really great way to get there and the industry is using it quite a bit yeah just look at this it doesn't look 3d unless you come really really close and can see like sure. polymers mm -hmm. 
this is why I um, stick uh, to the Moon Studio because I think they 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 producing really great uh, games. For example, this the environment is two D, uh, but the characters is three D. And it's beautiful. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, it's beautiful. And you can't you like unless you are into CG art, you can't really tell one from another. Like uh, people, like I met people who said, like, "Oh, you you drew all the things." <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> And it must it must be so fulfilling to see um, everything come together. See the and what the animators do with your character, and then how it fits into the into the full scene, um, like you showed us. Yeah, it is. Um, this is probably the best uh, thing about um, making a game. Then you can see it alive, mm -hmm. and people playing it and feel happy about it. It's yeah, it's a very rewarding. Yeah, very cool. So shout out to my colleagues. Actually, like, I only joined to, uh, to, to, to I only joined Ori and the Wheel of the Wisps like on the last half of a year. Before that, we were uh, doing it. Uh, just, just a second, I will share the screen again. Sure. I can, I can, uh, I can. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, the, my contribution is actually not that big. Uh, I'm working on another title for them, but it's um, it's secret. And of so course, I can't talk about <laughs> yeah. it. But uh, yeah, if you they they release some information, so if you're really curious what Moon Studios is doing next, just you can just Google it. But mm -hmm. uh, I can't show anything. That of it, course, it's gonna yeah, be good. no problem. No, and it's it's a beautiful like the the game that you did show us. What a beautiful look. Um, really, really nice looking. Um, and then we've got another learning related question. If and I don't want to cut you short from going to some of the other things you wanted to show, but someone was curious about uh, when you were self learning, what were some of the most effective ways that you went about doing that? Were you watching tutorials online? Were you talking, you know, emailing artists or like how did you, how did you self learn? So. <laughs> It was back in times when there was no tutorials on YouTube, almost none, so no online learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, th th we were talking about this um, Naman tutorials, but I actually never have my hands on them. He just like mentioned it. Oh, I, I, I have them and it's like, hmm, like a guy, but not me. But at that time, I was already like in the company uh, working on a game, so I was basically working and learning. It was mm -hmm. easier back then. I get into the video games with zero portfolio. I just did the art test and was good to go. Uh, what's helping me right now is, um, well, um, watching other people's streams. Mm -hmm. For example, Pixelogic, I, I like to watch the um, uh, actual Pixelogic people streaming because they actually share a lot of great tips on technical side. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I have a lot of friends in the industry right now. So on artistic side is, um, yeah, I would also watch tutorials. Um, so I guess everything is like, uh, watching tutorials is working for sure. Mm -hmm. Talking to people from the industry is uh, working. Um, everything. I mean, um, I sometimes understand for some people who just like get into this industry and they don't know a lot of people. It's hard to uh, build the circle of like-minded people. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know it's difficult to approach somebody who's like already known because I like I the, because most of artists are kind of introverts. Uh, but um, this is why there is a school out there. Like any art school uh, is good. It's it, it's good in giving you like um, social network for growth for. 
future mm-hmm. contacts. Yeah, but it was question about self learning, so it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, but well, um, find a group of like minded people. Discord, if you like, and somewhere Absolutely. far from hotspot of CG, like Los Angeles. Just uh, fi- there's a plenty of people who now having Discords and uh, Pixology have Discord, which is open for everyone. Mm-hmm. And you can always go there and drop your questions and people will help you. Like, because I know I'm, I'm on this Discord. Um, and actually, I, I do myself ask the questions on Discord sometimes if I don't know something and I want to achieve some effect that I don't know how to achieve myself. I will ask people. Yeah. Well, and you'd mentioned too, like, and I, I'll hear artists talk about it now, you know, 10, 12 years ago, getting into the industry or getting an entry level job on a game was a little bit different. The market is more saturated now. But the trade off, as you said, is that there's a lot more resources available uh, yeah. to learn from. So, you know, uh, things like, like this stream right here, you mentioned Discord. And I think just the fact that there's so much online learning now. Uh, that's available. Um, I think it's there's a trade-off, right? Because people can say, "Well, it was easier back then, and now it's really hard." But yeah. you know, back then you had less stuff <laughs> you, could, you I, could find and get your hands on. I I, I soft out myself in Photoshop using a mouse. I was drawing with a mouse. Oh, I was oh no wanted problem. To show mouse, not this one, but <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, and then uh, because I didn't have money to buy Vacom, Vacom was kind of expensive. And then uh, the um, I did have some Friedrich Max courses, like evening courses for people who work. They were shitty, like they, they don't know what we were talking about. <laughs> so mm. uh, it, it was a struggle right now. Like if you stubborn enough, you can you will find the sources. Sometimes I feel like now people just overwhelmed with uh, a lot of information like on YouTube and they don't know which tutorials are great, but they give you the hint, like you can watch this so you can watch uh, some Pixelogic stuff, which mm-hmm. is great. Um, yeah, um, I can mention some more, but I don't know if I'm, I can mention but people like uh, flipped normals, I think very, oh, sure. uh, very, yeah. very legit uh, learning resource. Uh, it's on YouTube. Also, I think they're selling Gumroad. Uh, a lot of Gumroads right now. Mm-hmm. Actually, well, oh, sorry, I was just going to because you had mentioned Pixel Logic. Uh, the great thing about Pixel Logic is they make a lot of learning available for people that want to learn their software. So if you go to Pixel Logic's website, they have a ZBrush classroom, which you can learn like a curriculum style in a classroom. You can learn how to use the software from the people who make the software. And then ZBrush is streaming all the time. Uh, and uh, you know, I know that you're streaming regularly with, with Pixel Logic as well. You know, people can, can catch your streams, uh, see your process. Um, and if you ever have a chance to catch you know, some of the someone like uh, Paul Gabri, who's one of the makers of ZBrush, he's great because he'll stop and take time to answer very technical specific questions. Yes. Um, you know, he's great. Paul Gabriel uh, Joseph. Mm-hmm. Joseph and uh, well. Mika- Michael Pavlovich mm-hmm. um, with three names. But then you go on Pixar Logic channel and just probably they that all the uh, learning because the streaming is still di- different. Like for example, my stream is mostly dedicated like mm-hmm. working in real time, less technical, but they are really good in explaining things. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And I think um, br- branching away from the self learning as well. Like, uh, and I'll get into more of this later. I'll share, share an info session after after a time with you, Lena. But. You know there are individual classes available as well at Nomen, uh, or you can take you can do the Nomen workshops. But the great thing about um, a school like Nomen uh, is that you can be learning from people who are actually doing the work professionally. You know, uh, all of our instructors are working in game studios and and working on films and things like that. So I think that there's uh, that also accelerates. So if you're already doing some self learning and then you want to make the investment to jump in the classroom with the right person with a professional. Um, it will accelerate your learning process um, as yeah. well. Yeah. For if sure. you feel like you're plateauing and you can't, you're gonna feel mm-hmm. like stuck, 
uh, taking a class with a mentor one on one would be uh, it could be helpful but like just choose wisely just choose mm -hmm. someone who re really admire and uh, yeah I'm, I'm agreeing on that mm -hmm. uh, now did you have some other things you wanted to oh yeah all, all most of the professionals I know are they're taking the time investment and sometimes the financial investment too because you're never going to run out of something to learn <laughs> there's always going to be a new mm -hmm. thing yeah, for this sure. This is a century, guys. Like you have to learn all your life, mm -hmm. like nonstop. This is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I'm talking too much, and uh, I just no problem. Want probably to jump and talk a little yeah, bit let's of, do it. about 3D printing because it was in our list of things. Uh, uh, mm, so. Uh, it's my my uh, screen is on. Yeah, we'll get your screen share back up there. There okay, we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, ZBrush for three D printing. So uh, since I mentioned and Adam mentioned, I mostly working in video games. So three D printing um, is still a relatively new thing for me. But I did this girl like a few years ago, and I wanted to print her for uh, the brush summit actually, and for having a uh, amount of copies to sell. Mm -hmm. And here, this is the final miniature, and this is uh, the final miniature and the kit, like a uh, few postcards and the sticker. This is how it was sold. So uh, actually the miniature business is quite big and you can find like uh, a lot of uh, comics and movie heroes. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big thing among the f people who are fans, like DS, DS Comics, like Wonder Woman, Marvel, mm -hmm. you know, huge market on in Asian countries. So, but I, I only printed one of my works which is like the only experience I have with my work. But nevertheless, I just want to show people maybe they consider this as a profession. Why not? It's a mm -hmm. very, very legit thing to do. So uh, how it's usually done. Um, I have a ZBrush uh, model and I want to print it. This is uh, this is still a render. This is a gray render in key shot. Mm -hmm. And let me open this folder. So if you want basically to print one example, uh, which is like it, it could one or two, one or two figurines. It's not a big deal. You can just use printer. This is. Form Labs uh, printed my one of my says me with this uh, print one of my busts and you can even see the supports that they use for 3D printing. Uh, so one or two things you only pay for price of using printer and resin, not a big deal. But if you want to to make a production line, even like small, maybe 10, 20, 30 copies. You will need uh, actually go into full process of um, not only preparing your uh, sculpt for printing, but also like engineering it. And by engineering, I mean basically cut this into pieces like that. Uh, still uh, in the brush. And they they're gonna print each piece separately, <clears throat> and then they're gonna cast it. They because it's it, it's done usually uh, by uh, by company who doing this thing. Yes, you can do it at home if, in your garage if you have, and if you have three D printer, I don't. So I have to use uh, a Gun Con company called um, Onage. But the guys did really great job. So. Uh, after the, you have this uh, engineered and printed on 3D printer, the next thing you're going to be doing is they're going to cast 
they or they did cast or but the next step is casting is basically making uh silicon mold out of each piece and then you have basically that amount of uh casted figurines all in pieces uh and um this is usually how it's shipped to your future uh the potential buyers uh customers mm, and then uh this is like a normal situation people like to build build the kids and the people like to paint it so for example i think it, it, this is how th this is then it actually build it in uh uh in actual uh figurine mm -hmm. so i want to mention a few things first of all when i uh announced that i want to print it and it was my first experience and i said like i, I went out on social media and said like guys i want to print it and people were like no it's not gonna work like this ribbon is never gonna work uh, it's a it's a it's a miniature it's like no it will and it it did uh it will uh it 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 it, it did require a lot some changes not a lot of changes actually uh, let me actually open the actual model so i can mm -hmm. show you it in a real the real thing so but, uh, so let's let's check the model here we go this is a girl and i don't need perspective and you can see like that for example it has like thin pieces like uh the higher pieces just super super thin uh and sticking out so i have to get rid of those or make them thicker so it like uh wouldn't break once casted and actually tiny pieces not gonna work mm -hmm. but for example uh, a lot of these higher pieces are still working. I have to make them thicker. I have to make these ribbons thicker. And uh, I have to push some of them closer to the body so they don't break because of the weight or something. But it still worked perfectly, as you can, as you can see here. Oh, not uh, here. Let's, let's open actual photo. It's still working. Uh, and the other thing is about her earrings. I think uh, if you can see here, they're just floating. This is a genius thing about 3D. You can make things floating and just fine. But in real life, like you, you have to figure out it somehow. And um, like my first idea was sometimes just like make them thick and just like push them towards her face so it would be like the solid piece of her face or something but um uh, the guy who was working with me on this uh, on uh, the side of a uh, printing company and casting company he said like no let's do it as, as real earrings and what and they did uh, like you can see on that example they make it, uh, they drill a small hole in her ear, put mm -hmm. a metal ring and make this earring work as a real earrings, which I oh, think is cool. genial. That's really cool. And yeah, so uh, a lot of things are actually possible in a figuring production. And um, if you want to go and check like a lot of Asian figurines, they are crazy. Like sometimes I couldn't figure out how they make it work, but they they still exist and they work in real life. So uh, it's not that limiting. Huh? Oh no! It seems that that's an advantage of because people are always asking, you know, should I just go buy my own three D printer, make that investment, and then do my own printing, or should I go with a company? But it seems that the advantage of going with a company, of course, is that you can pay them for some of those kinds of engineering problem solving and stuff like that. And you've got their professional experience. Yeah, frankly, uh, my apartment is very slow. Oh, <laughs> very small. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in my case, I even don't have a place to put a 3D printer 
at, at home. So it's no, no for me. So I have to use somebody to print the stuff. So people don't put 3D printer into your bedroom because although it's quite safe, it's not really good to uh, have these fumes in the place where you sleeping or living mm -hmm. so yeah there is uh for, for me no no i only can use somebody i bet there is plenty of people who have the same problem so uh having your print sent to a printing company is valuable option and it's if you if you unless you really print in all the time it's actually economically uh better because uh printing and resin is costing a lot of money and so unless you use it every day like mm -hmm. um it, it, it's it, it's better to have uh to, to use uh, like either service to print one or toy service to cast yeah sorry yeah no and I, I think that it, a lot of it, maybe a lot of people still don't realize that you can you have a whole service available to you that you can have someone else do the do the printing do the work and then just uh, calculate that as a part of the cost of making the things that you want to sell i know i love the idea of being able to print up my own miniature or model that i'm going to paint and, and put together and then you have a, you have a one of a kind uh, it's pretty cool um, do you, let's see, uh, I didn't know if you had some more things you wanted to jump into or we could jump into some questions now. What would you prefer? Uh, yes, I promise it brush for illustration because uh, this is the last part. Sure, I, let's do I, feel, it. <laughs> I feel like I have to talk about it. So of course, yeah, go for it. Come back. And talk a little bit about this. So. Here we go, like as, uh, it was mentioned, I did, uh, during my career, I did both 2D and 3D. And it's kind of really misfortune that this picture went uh, as a promo because I'm sorry people like noisy brush in this one. <laughs> I'm really apology, but I still use the brush as a means of illustration. And I'm gonna show you like two examples of that. This one, this is basically a 3D model that I rendered, uh, heavily photoshopped, overpaint, and get this like um, dreamy art nouveau look. So yeah, it's let's, beautiful. Uh, let, <laughs> let me show you. Let me show you. I have it open, but uh, yeah. So. Uh, Unfortunately, you can see this final image here. Let me let me zoom. Let me properly zoom on it. And this uh, uh, Photoshop file that I found is not a final one, but it's still valuable to show you how my process for uh, turning ZBrush into uh, 2D. And let me show you also something else. Let me show you the original of this model. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use file. One. No. Let's go into illustration. It's gonna take time because this one is heavy. Yeah, here we go. So this is an actual uh, bust, bust again. Uh, very stylized and uh, initially the work was done for ArtStation demo back a few years ago. And uh, what I usually do, I like to use ZBrush render system. It's kind of primitive, but it's good to render stylized stuff. So let me show you. So basically what I did, I, I put my model and did render it in built-in uh, BPR render. So you can see I have some shadow like really nice i really love the shadows um outline and then i just uh pick up my render passes you can see here you can have a few of them uh shaded this is a main picture uh depth uh, shadow and a mask and then i taking them to photoshop 
and um, I do combine them. I do combine them. Let's uh, probably let's show you, for example, what was it? Uh, <clears throat> not this. Just pull it on top. We'll see what it is. Uh, so I think it was depth layer. I mean, I can normal. Yeah, it was depth. Uh, which I use as a multiply. So it's giving it some depth, a little bit of um, darkening on the back. So I the front uh, would uh, pop up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, actually I have all, all these layers I mentioned. I have um, my, uh, but it is shadow pass, depth uh, pass here. And then I just overpaint. It's easy as it, it could be. Let me zoom so everybody can see. Well, maybe on her face. So I did add texture on her face a little bit. Let me, let me zoom. I did uh, paint this cracks, a little bit of noise there and there. And uh, let's just go and you can see like some shadows where I feel like this need shadows. Uh, some extra details, like uh, is it, what was it? The flower. Look, mm -hmm. you look here, and those flowers on the back actually also painted. Let go on the back, not this layer. This layer. So you have an idea. So I have a render, but I heavily overpaint to create basically a new. Um, art, a new illustration based on uh, ZBrush model. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, let me open this again. So there is um, a final version. I have like even more noise, even more uh, fine uh, overpainting, uh, like thin high pieces, which would be like really hard to make in ZBrush, but like it took me like two seconds to add in a Photoshop. So yeah, this is how you can reuse it brush for illustrations. Um, but in general, I think it's pretty much a common thing for concept artists to do uh, very primitive uh, uh, models like ZBrush or Blender models, then render it and use it for lighting and perspective. Mm -hmm. But usually it's th then uh, it it, it's done for concept art. You don't have a lot of detail, so it's basically like mannequins. If you if we're talking about human characters, and it's like if it's environment, it's just usually boxes where you uh, can it, they that you can uh, overpaint or use Photoshop over them to uh, get where you want to where a client want to, the picture to be. Yeah, and ZBrush and Photoshop are a great combination. And I know that ZBrush has got that great uh, plugin that'll let you just literally send all the render layers that you want to do straight to Photoshop, um, and it'll set up a PSD file for you. I've done yeah, a similar thing myself. Possible. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, no, and it's possible. I think, and I don't know about for you, but one of the, I think one of the challenging things for me and for others that I've talked to is sometimes when you spend you know, a considerable amount of time in ZBrush getting some great details in place and, and things that you want. And then you send it for a final 2D image is to kind of let go of the fact that it's 3D and just treat it like an illustration and do some of the painting and paint over like you did and, you know, uh, push it even further with, with the 2D art. Um, don't, don't let it be so, so sacred that you aren't willing to let some things go. Well, I, I don't know. I can see that sometimes um, most of my uh, final renders, we, we, all final renders need touch up. Like, mm -hmm. here is a rule for you guys. 90% uh, from render and then 10% from Photoshop. Like, never ignore Photoshop because even just simple thing as levels and contrast could actually make your render better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I do use a little bit of cheating. I can, I can do lasso and like, uh, if I feel like lighting is not 
no, no it's not bright enough i can i can fix it i um if we if i can share the screen i can i can uh, show an example of that mm -hmm. the it was mostly post-production on render yeah, okay get your screen share up there so for example for that girl here we go, here we go. uh she's an actual model uh and this is a key shot render with a little bit of uh, Photoshop wizardry. So um, I enhance the lighting that I can mm -hmm. to make it pop better. And I add this, like, I like this glow things. I have them everywhere. They're just uh, cheating, but I feel good about it. And yeah, like you can see, all of them have probably 10% of Photoshop. It's still, mm -hmm. like, it's still, uh, all those details are modeled but in in order to make them better and make in order to make it shine I, like photoshop is your friend and actually there is uh, my time lapse so if anybody curious how it's done cool. uh, they can just i'm speaking on the background <laughs> but yeah and you can see this is basically was a speed sculpt it was nothing it's like it's not supposed to be like any a production model or something. It's just mm -hmm. fun. Shit, I'm gonna go away. It's just fun. Um, maybe week or uh, week time project. That means I was. I probably took took a week of spare time for me to to mm -hmm. make your final and uh, to render her and key shot and for all this post production. For example. Well, it came out beautifully too. It's really, really nice. I love how you are using the 3D also to get uh, that Art Nouveau look, which can, especially the geometry in the background, like the circle and stuff, that can be very flat in an Art Nouveau type of presentation, but you're able to get all that beautiful lighting information uh, from your from your ZBrush render. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was key shot, actually. The, the last one was key shot, but... Okay. Um, I can like, for example, here I can show a difference between key shot lighting and uh, ZBrush because it's another character I made actually for NVIDIA, uh, uh, NVIDIA tutorial. So if people you're curious about uh, how, I'm, how I'm working from inspiration board to final sculpture, uh, you can find it on um, uh, YouTube, like NVIDIA Studio Sessions. They have a lot of great artists. Like, if you're not interested in me, just check it out because uh, there is plenty of great stuff. But, uh, for example, this is uh, the brush render. Oh. And I like it because it's kind of already stylized. It's mm -hmm. have this flat quality in it. It's like not intense lighting, maybe not uh, so beautifully rendered shadows. And the skin is, uh, I, I like how the skin and the brush render look, but it's not actual realism, not actual realistic mm -hmm. skin. But um, this is key shot. So you can see the light could be like really interesting. There's few sources of light all, all around my model. Uh, this fireball is actually uh, um, like going through your skin and making this subsurface scattering like this very very uh, let me let me let me zoom because otherwise like people don't know what i'm talking about is bright uh, uh colors on your skin and you put your you put your hand close to the light source and like you do flash mm -hmm. uh give us like insanely bright color um this is what you can make with key shot and any like um serious renders like key shot octan redshift very um like if your ears have a little bit of subsurface scattering so like mm -hmm. going through the ears uh, uh eyes have a little bit of more reflection and uh like metal look more metal although i absolutely satisfied on how the Z brush metal looks like uh, in this more stylized realm of things. But yeah, I mean, 
both of them is really both approaches are really great i like both of them i use both keyshot and zbrush renders i'm used to use v-ray but i don't use it anymore because the way of doing things is in v-ray is really uh too much interface too much uh they have the this is a software of um, uh, interface is really complicated like very and 3 ds max for this matter so mm -hmm. yeah yeah i love these illustrations you've been showing us um it's i think uh, uh, and for people that are new to 3d they don't realize that sometimes you don't realize 3d is just a great tool on as one of the steps in creating a, a nice painting or creating a great illustration i know that uh there are artists out there doing comic book covers uh using using zbrush uh getting started in there um i want to be respectful of your time alina so if you don't mind we can jump to just a just a few more questions uh, before we yeah. finish up okay cool um so one of the questions that came in uh was um from one of our viewers uh for someone learning character modeling for the first time uh, would you suggest that they maybe get started with more of a traditional box modeling method first, say like a 3ds Max or Maya, or could they just jump right into ZBrush? Jump right into ZBrush. Then you can concentrate on on art side of things and not thinking mm -hmm. about polygons. Uh, ZBrush is so much artistic friendly compared to any other software. Maybe like everything that has sculpting is way more artist friendly so no don't do don't attempt like you can like who i am to tell you not to do that but if you want to progress quickly if you become want to become a better artist quickly like said brush is your friend mm -hmm. yeah i think if you were wanting to add a uh, character modeling to a broader skill set like a 3d generalist or something like that um it's always nice to kind of get that broader approach but you know, I know that I'm the first 3D software I really spent a lot of time working in was with ZBrush, um, and ZBrush is great. Um, also, Blender has some some sculpting options as well. It's not quite the same as ZBrush, but that's a great free option uh, to jump yes. into as well. Yes, it, like if you can't afford ZBrush, and I understand it's for for somebody who just new to CG. Like honestly, the price of equipment and the price of software could be. Uh, quite high so yeah this is an option and like um I, I i personally haven't been working in blender but uh it's a valuable option and yeah go for that absolutely um mm -hmm. uh, yeah but just on the model boxing this is something i tried to convey when i was talking about oh my my this little froggy f f what i did for ori like um there are four people in my team and three of us using ZBrush, and uh, our lead is actually really old school, and he used uh, 3ds Max uh, the, the box modeling to start and to finish. He he barely used ZBrush. He's 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 switching right now. So even he is switching. Mm -hmm. So uh, and we're all working approximately with the same speed. So there is no gain in speed, and this like as I said, like you can just concentrate on art shapes forms and on your character instead of like moving and uh, polygons and thinking what what uh, uh what ffd you have to use if you mm -hmm. don't know what i'm talking about yeah and then someone's also wondering uh what would be your go-to tool for quick uh or kind of easy retopo if it's strictly for illustration or something like that so model doesn't have to be animated uh, so it's not for animations. The brush have a perfect tool for uh, it's called Zeta Measure. Let me open that. Let's like I don't know maybe ah it's 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 merged but yeah this is here. It's like you can see oh no uh, oh let's get your screen I wasn't share. sharing. I'm I'm really sorry. No problem. no problem. This is happening all the time. Let me open everything. There we go. So yeah, the brush Zeta Measure. You can see I'm using it quite frequently. There is a uh, geometry in your menu. Uh, the the, the, the is here. So you can decide how much polygons you want. You just can decide like freeze group. Like 
it, it's very powerful to go check uh, tutorials uh, that you can find on Pixelogic and on any reliable places. Yes, absolutely. If you go check some uh, tutorials on uh, NVIDIA Studio, I'm sorry, <laughs> I mentioned NVIDIA for the second time, but for example, Maria Panfilova, uh, and our artist had, had, had done a great tutorial for um, NVIDIA. She just using the brush measure, I believe, and uh, then uh, uh, unwrap it, creating UV, and then mm -hmm. taking it to uh, texturing application. So yeah, absolutely. You should. Yeah, and if you're, um, I know for myself and uh, some of the instructors at Noman, if you're just going to take it quickly into um, something like a key shot, uh, even just uh, the decimation master in ZBrush is great. If you um, yeah, break it down I mean, a bit. I feel like um, depending on what you want to do, like some people using the substance painter really heavily because it gives like really nice mm -hmm. uh, metallic effects, uh, like I don't know, material effects, like it, it's um, basically like five minute thing to create really nice material. Uh, you need UV. Uh, I, I, I haven't used it without UV and I don't believe it's possible. Maybe things changes. I haven't been working painters since 2019, but uh, at least it's gonna be faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. UV and your model is uh, not that heavy, at least this, they can process it faster. But yes, you can use the summation master. And for render, for example, this girl, uh, that, that the last one that I should show, uh, the, the, the Art Nouveau one, um, I did use K-Shot, I use K-Shot. Yeah, 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 and you can't you can't put a uh, uh, full blown sculpt and key shot. Even key shot wouldn't manage that much of a poly count. So yeah, you have to decimate it. But it's different than decimating the uh, Z measure. It's a different purposes. Anyway, it's too much of a details, honestly. Yeah, and you can look online. Uh, what what why are you gonna fit your goals? Absolutely. And definitely, if you want to unwrap, um, uh, substance is awesome. <laughs> substance is a great way to go. Yeah. Sometimes people do mark, do unwrap and do texturing, like really hardcore texturing, even if it's not for the games. They just use it as a means mm -hmm. of creating art. And then, um, you know, what are, we've got a sort of a, a general question that's come in about you know looking looking towards the future. Uh, what are some of the things that you are excited about? Uh, some of the developments that you see happening, or something that you would like to see developed in the future for for three D artists. Um, please, somebody do. I would apologize. <laughs> Software <laughs> to make it automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to skip this part. Um, and wrap, and I can really this technical part is still there, and it's mm -hmm. still as laborious as, as it was like ten years ago. It, it's getting better, and in, in in general, like engines getting better. But um, yeah, I'm still looking for good uh, artificial intelligence to do my UV and my topology for me. But am I excited? I'm cautious because um, I don't know, guys. Um, it's gonna probably give a hard times for a lot of people who are good in technical art, but not good in art, uh, and not good in like a cre like designing the characters, for example. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm in general excited about development of uh, uh, game development. Past year because of, of remote working and people start to feel like maybe the artists don't need oversight all the time and we can just work uh, in the quiet of our bedrooms. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it's definitely been, uh, it's been cool to see how the gaming industry in particular, I've got a lot of friends who are working in game studios. Uh, games did really well 
during the pandemic because people needed something to do um, while they were stuck at home. And so uh, did, it didn't seem like the game studios and those working there had a very difficult time, maybe at the very beginning. Um, and then now, yeah, we're all, we've all sort of relocated and are working remotely. Um, so maybe it's a little bit uh, easier world for those of us who might be a little more introverted um, <laughs> in our work style. But um, Alina, thank you so much uh, for giving your time today. Uh, really appreciate you taking us through um, not just one, but three different areas that you're using, using your artwork in. Um, and uh, if you guys aren't already following Alina on ArtStation or any of the socials, uh, my colleague will drop a link in the chat. I would definitely suggest you go check it out. Um, I personally really love some of the illustrative stuff you showed us today. Um, it makes me want to go jump back into ZBrush and, and, and try some of those, some of those uh, types of renderings uh, going into 2D. Yeah, you should, absolutely. And mm -hmm. thanks a lot, guys, for having me again. It was uh, such a pleasure. Absolutely. And, and hopefully, uh, yeah, I know that we, we may not have one this year, but as soon as we've got ZBrush Summit up and going again, I look forward to seeing you back on Absolutely. the Nomad campus. Yeah. Absolutely All right, cool. missing it so much. Okay, bye bye and thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, Alina. Um, guys, I'm gonna stick around just a little bit longer for those of you. Um, and please give your give your love and thanks to Alina in the chat as she heads out. Um, but I'd like to take a few minutes just to share with you a little bit about Nomen um, and uh, some of the uh, options that Nomad presents for you to train in these areas and to prepare for a career, a uh, long-term career, uh, doing CG, uh, 3D modeling, visual effects, and so forth. So I'm just going to get my screen share up on the screen here. There we go. And um, I'm going to take you in really quickly. Just get my screen ready. There we go. OK, so as I mentioned, we first jumped into the stream today. Nomen is a 3D art school. Um, and for those of you who may are, be more familiar with Nomen as uh, the creators of the Nomen Workshop, uh, the Nomen Workshop is a sister company uh, of the school, same origins, um, but it's essentially a place, the real physical campus that you can come to in Hollywood and learn these kinds of skill sets. And uh, we got started back in 1997. Um, and this was really when there was that first real original demand, when it was really becoming uh, something that studios and directors wanted to have realistic CG uh, in their films. The, the video game industry was booming, and suddenly there was a high demand for artists with these kinds of skill sets. And so um, Nomen's founder, Alex Alvarez, who also is an industry artist, he started Nomen as a place where industry artists could come and learn how to use software like Maya and how to create um, uh, 3D, uh, not only 3D models, but also animation, and uh, how to do that for the visual effects pipeline. Um, since then, Nomen has grown into becoming a full-blown college. Uh, and you can see here, we've won quite a few awards over the years. Um, and because we're very good at what we do, our alumni go on to work on some pretty amazing projects. So on the screen here, you can see just a sampling of some of the um, more recent projects that Nomen has had alumni contribute to. And um, these are some of the studios you might be familiar with who are regularly hiring graduates from Nomen. And I should point out at the top of the screen there, something that's really important to us at Nomen is our industry placement rate. Um, Nomen's mission is not just to provide artists with technical skills and then expect you to go figure out how to turn that into a career after you graduate. We really see our mission as supplying the, the demand that's in the industry, supplying that demand with the best artists. And so, um, you know, we've typically averaged out at around 97% for our industry placement rate. Um, also good to note that even last year in 2020, during a pandemic, still we had 94% percent of the graduates from our full-time program find a job in the industry doing what they trained to do within just six months of finishing the program. So this is really important to us. We want to see that um, artists are becoming ready for employment at the time that they finish Nomen's programs so that, that they, they can line up that first job and launch out there into the industry. We have a fantastic department um, that is actively working with studios and their recruiters to make sure that our graduates know about all the jobs that are available out there. And we actually provide those placement services to our graduates throughout their careers. So not just when you're finishing the program, but through the rest of your professional career, if you're ever in need of um, additional help in lining up your next job, Nomen's there for you if you're one of our alumni. 
All right, so what are artists learning uh, at Noman? Uh, Noman is a highly focused college. Um, so the way that I would describe that is it would be if you took, uh, say, more of a traditional art school and you took literally just one of the many art programs in that school. In this case, it would be digital production, as you can see here. And you took just that one aspect and blew that up into being a full-blown college uh, using all of that college's resources to just training that one thing. And that's what Noman is. We do one thing extremely well. And this term digital production is going to be sort of a catch-all phrase for the following types of disciplines. These are things like computer-based visual effects, character and creature design, digital sculpting, uh, which we were looking at today with Alina, uh, character and creature animation, environment design, lighting and rendering, matte painting and compositing, uh, game asset creation, game engines, production workflows, and world building. Um, now, some of those terms you might be familiar with, some of these might be new for you, but every one of those skills translates into the following types of careers. So every title you see on the screen right now is a different step or a different discipline uh, within the digital production pipeline, whether that's for a game or for a film. And every one of these positions in that pipeline is a career path unto itself. Um, and these are typically the uh, types of careers that our graduates are going into. Uh, now, we don't have time today for me to highlight every one of these, but I do want to go over four of them. And uh, I've selected these because each one of them is a little bit unique from the other, and it'll give you an idea of kind of the, the wide range of types of jobs that are out there. Uh, for artists studying digital production. So the first is a character artist, and this artist does exactly what the name implies. Um, this is what uh, Alina was showing us today, some of the character art that she's done um, for games. And this artist is using ZBrush, which we saw today, and, and this is a perfect type of software for anything that's going to need to be sculpted, uh, whether that's an organic shape found in nature, whether that's cloth, whether that's you know um, more, more nuanced geometry. And so what this allows you to do is to use traditional sculpting techniques, uh, just like you would with clay, but to do it digitally with a virtual 3D ball of clay to work with. Um, so this is a great position in the pipeline for artists who also like to draw, are probably spending time not only sculpting creatures or characters like this, but they're also drawing them on paper. Um, and uh, this is awesome for anyone who wants to stay uh, very sort of like traditional and visually art leaning um, in a 3D pipeline. Next up are effects artists. And these are the artists that I like to affectionately say, uh, basically they sit in front of their computer and they blow stuff up all day long. And um, that's because uh, these are the artists that come up with and kind of dream up how to create stunning sequences like this. Uh, that space station we were looking at is from the film Gravity, which won awards for its visual effects. And this is um, this falls within the realm of 3D animation, but it's not uh, traditional animation like you would do, say, for a character. Instead, because this is animating so many different pieces of geometry, so many little teeny droplets of water and so forth um, at once, you can't go in and do it traditionally. <coughs> Excuse me. Instead, uh, these uh, artists are using special software that drives physics simulations. Um, so they are uh, using the software to create simulations for stuff like how does uh, the debris of a space station break up in orbit, in space, and weightlessness, um, or an explosion like this. They can simulate things like smoke, fire, water, gravity, you name it. And these are the artists that are coming up with a lot of the, the movie magic that we're seeing today in films, usually that sort of jaw-dropping moment that you see in a trailer uh, for an upcoming film. Next up, we can look at compositors. Uh, a compositor is more towards the end of the pipeline, and that is because they're not the artist that makes all of the individual animations or 3D objects and things like that. They're the person that receives all of those different parts from the other artists, but they're the ones that know how to weave it together into a scene like this. So for example, the background and tennis courts are 3D models. The tennis players are actors that were filmed in front of green screens. You've got the models, which are also 3D, or the buildings that are 3D models. You have lighting and texturing that's put on those models. Additional actors are inserted. A final lighting pass is done, and you wind up with a great composited scene like this from the film Wolf of Wall Street. Um, and this is a job that's in high demand. Um, it is used quite often, uh, whether it's for something that's going to be obviously you know, a fantastical location that couldn't be filmed in the real world, 
or for scenes like this, um, where maybe you could find a real world location to film that scene on, but it saves the director a lot of time and money to have that done in compositing um, instead of hiring film crews and getting permits uh, for special locations and insurance to film there and so forth. Now VFX houses can put together these shots uh, for directors to be used uh, in their films. The third uh, role we're gonna look at are um, previs artists. And a previs artist uh, is basically they're making more simplified animation. They're using simpler 3D models. And that's because they're not trying to just spend months and months on one little scene. They're actually creating a moving storyboard for the entire film. So this is the previs animation for the film uh, World War Z. And as you can see here, you know, the driver doesn't look pixel, you know, pixel perfect, uh, Brad Pitt. It's just sort of a placeholder for the actor, but they are blocking out the entire scene, all of the different moving pieces, stuff that's gonna be actual real uh, things and cars that are gonna be in camera, as well as things that are gonna be visual effects later on. They control the movement of the camera, kind of how the camera is gonna move through the scene. So these are animators who are working very closely with the director and the cinematographer to get a, uh, a, a sort of a sketch of the entire film done in this way so that everybody else who's gonna work on the film in production can be working from one common vision. All right, so with just four of those, you know, very diverse jobs in mind, let's talk about um, NOMA's programs or academic offerings and how we are training artists to fill those roles. Uh, so as you can see here, we have four main areas of offering. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we have our Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in digital production, which essentially is a full-time four-year college degree. It's going to teach you the entire pipeline that we talked about, and you're going to be able to walk away from that education with a college degree. Um, now, on the upper right-hand side, we have something called a certificate program. This is a two-year full-time program, and it's a little bit more advanced than the bachelor's, and it's gonna be a little bit closer to something like a master's level type of training. Um, and then on the bottom row here, and I should note that the first two that I just mentioned, those require an actual portfolio application. Uh, there is an application process uh, to be accepted into those programs. But these last two that I'm going to mention, starting with the foundation, do not require a portfolio submission. In fact, the foundation is designed to help you build your portfolio at Nomen, which you would then use to apply to one of our programs. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And then lastly, uh, Nomen has a lot of individual courses. These are just individual 10-week classes that you can take at Nomen. They don't require a portfolio submission. This is just something you can sign up for online. So um, moving forward to our Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, as I mentioned, this is a fully accredited and full-time program on the Noman campus. Accreditation means that uh, financial aid and, and grants, things like that, are going to be available to you. Um, and we have a department at the school that, is, that has done the research, can point you towards the types of uh, aid that you can apply for. Uh, being full-time on our campus, uh, yes, Classes at Noman take a considerable amount of your time as a student, and that is because uh, we want to make sure that within the four years that you're in our program, we are able to teach you everything that you're going to need to know to be an employable artist in the industry after graduation. Uh, we're very excited uh, that uh, now that things are starting to reopen again, uh, we'll be opening up our campus again for in-person learning starting in our fall term. And if you want to know more about the dates for that and application deadlines and so forth, you can feel free uh, to ask your questions. And my colleague, Xander, who is one of our admissions advisors, can help you out in the chat with further information. Now, the Bachelor of Fine Arts program at Noman also has two optional concentrations. So when you're going through the bachelor's, you're going to be learning the entire pipeline. You're going to pick, get to pick out uh, four electives in your last four terms that let you uh, put a little bit more emphasis into particular areas that you're interested in learning more about. But if you choose one of these concentrations, uh, for example, uh, the game art concentration, that will uh, fine tune some of your curriculum uh, to make sure that you're learning the pipeline specifically as it would apply for working within game engines, uh, which is going to be a prerequisite uh, knowledge for you to know in order to go work in a game studio. Uh, making games, uh, places like Naughty Dog, Riot Games, and so forth. Uh, now, the other concentration that we have is a VFX concentration. And what that does is it opens up classes that are a little bit more advanced in visual effects that were previously only available in the two-year program. 
It brings some of those classes into our four-year program as well for the students that want to go after the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, but have spent extra learning specifically for a visual effects pipeline. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at Noman covers all the aspects of what is called a 3D generalist skill set, which basically means you're going to get in-depth knowledge of the entire 3D production pipeline. Um, that is why Noman graduates are sought after by studios, because they know that they're not just getting a lighting artist or an animator or something like that. They're getting a person that is applying for that position who also understands the rest of the entire pipeline, which makes them a much more valuable team member. It makes them a much more effective part of that team. Um, and it also gives you staying power on projects where you can also branch into other areas where there may be need on that film or in that game that isn't your primary area that you're hired for, but you can, you can help cover some of those other aspects as well. So you learn the entire 3D production pipeline, and then you get to pick out specific electives that let you build more skill in the area that you're passionate about. Uh, the Bachelor of Fine Arts program at Noman has what is called a rolling admission, which means you can apply not just in the fall, but also in the winter, spring, and summer. Uh, summer term is currently underway. Uh, next up would be the fall, uh, which will be starting on campus, and uh, you can inquire more about that if that's something that you're interested in applying for at Noman. Next up uh, is our two-year certificate program. As I said before, this is more advanced. It's more akin to a master's level type of study. And this is typically utilized by students who may already have an art degree. Um, they've gone to another school and they want to come to Noman for just two very intense years to train specifically in digital production. Um, so this is uh, going to still help you build that foundational 3D skill set. You're going to learn the pipeline, but then you get to pick from one of five areas to really emphasize your study on that. It could be things ranging from modeling and texturing to animation uh, to visual effects, uh, games, and so forth. Now, next up, uh, I want to talk about the foundation briefly because the foundation at Noman is there to help students who want to go to a full-time program at Noman but may not have a portfolio put together yet or perhaps you may not have had the opportunity to take some of those tr more foundational, traditional art classes and skill sets that you might need to build on as a foundation when you're studying 3D at Noman. So what we did was we created a one year long course called Our Foundation in Art and Design. This is uh, something you don't have to stay in it for the entire year. It's spread out over four terms, but it's going to be um, foundational classes like figure drawing, anatomy for artists, learning how to draw, in perspective, uh, color and light theory, visual composition. And then you also get into some really great design classes like character and creature design, vehicle and mech design, environment design. These are all really important skills to have as your foundation so that when you go and you start learning how to work in 3D, you are drawing from a traditional art mindset, uh, strong, strong foundations, things like anatomy and perspective and composition. Um, now, you don't have to stay in it for the entire year. You can just get in and take the courses that you might need. Um, and you can do this together with uh, one of our admissions advisors who can advise you on uh, classes that you might still need to round out your skills. And um, you can use that time in the foundation to build up that portfolio that you're then going to use to apply to one of Noman's full-time programs. Um, lastly, I'll mention that Noman has well over 70 individual classes available. These are classes that are also a part of our full-time programs. Uh, all the classes at Noman are a cumulative 30 hours of class time, which is uh, three hour classes once a week spread out over 10 weeks. Um, we also have some online uh, options as well. The summer term at Noman, still all of our offerings are 100% online, but as we transition, back to uh, campus in the fall. A lot of those uh, classes will then be able to be done in person, which is going to be great. Um, and there will still be some online options too. Uh, so if you're interested in individual class at Noman, this is something you can browse on our website to find out when the next term is starting up. You can simply sign up. You don't need a portfolio to apply. And if you're curious as to which class might be the best one for you that you're most suited to, you can also talk with Noman's advisors about uh, what would be a good class to start out with. 
Uh, and speaking of Noman's advisors, I do want to mention uh, that admissions at Noman is really unique. This is one of the things that we do very differently than a lot of art schools. Sort of the traditional art school experience with admissions is the admissions advisor is kind of the last person you talk to when you've got all of your portfolio and your application ready to go and you send it all that to them and then you have to stand back and wait to find out whether or not you got into the school. At Noman, we do it very, very differently. Advisors at Noman are the first people you want to talk to. Uh, so this is our team of our four fantastic advisors, and they are more like coaches. Uh, so what they want to do is, even if you're just interested in Noman, they want to be available to do a few really important things for you. They will, of course, answer more information and provide you with more in-depth perspective as to what Noman's offerings are and the kinds of careers you can pursue through our programs. Um, but most importantly, they will take the time to coach you in your artwork. They'll do art mentorship and help you uh, put together your portfolio. Um, this obviously is going to be different than the foundation, which is an actual course for portfolio prep preparation, and they can help you know if that's something that's good for you. But additionally, they will just simply look over artwork that you're working on, and they will start to mention areas that you may want to focus on or improve or incorporate other types of pieces into your body of work uh, to help prepare you to apply. So they want to offer coaching to you before you actually apply to our school. This is really valuable because it gives you the knowledge you need to know before you apply so that you are sending in the best possible portfolio that you can send in. It has the most relevant artwork um, that you've done. And uh, of course, they can assist you with all of the other questions that might come up during the application process. So I can't stress enough how important it is to talk to one of these advisors uh, to utilize the, the time and the one-on-one -on -one coaching that they're willing to offer you if you're interested in our school. And my colleague, uh, Xander, who's also pictured here, uh, he's one of our advisors. He can provide you with a link in the chat that will allow you to uh, basically uh, say, hey, I want one of Noman's advisors to reach out to me. You'll fill out some simple information online and um, you'll receive an email from, uh, from one of our advisors. And I would just ad advise that you uh, keep an eye on your spam folder and your email just in case your email server doesn't recognize the address and, and routes it there but you will get an email from admissions um, if you fill out that form and say, hey, I wanna to talk to someone. And that's how you get started with that coaching process. Next up, um, I should mention that we are super excited to be able to be returning to campus in the fall. Uh, we showed that fantastic campus reel at the beginning of the stream today. If you didn't see it, definitely go back and watch that reel um, uh, video on demand on our YouTube or Twitch channels. But um, the Noman campus is actually on a production lot in Hollywood. And uh, that does a couple of really awesome things for us. Number one, it gives our students a super immersive and creative space to learn in that is gonna be more like being in a studio rather than just sort of on an academic campus. Um, the other thing that being located in Hollywood helps us with is it helps us connect our graduates to studios and work upon completion um, of our programs, but it also helps us to source our instructors. Every instructor at Noman, whether they're teaching one of our full-time programs or any of our individual classes, all of them are required to be working industry professionals. So if you are uh, learning about designing environments for games, you could be with our instructor, Nate Stevens, who, had, who led the team uh, in developing the environments for the game, God of War. Uh, so you will be in the classroom with artists that are actively day-to-day -day doing the thing that you wanna be doing professionally uh, once you graduate. Uh, we also have a lot of fantastic events and live streams. Uh, you know, during during quarantine, all of these have been done as live streams, like today's event. Uh, but once campus open up opens up again, we'll be able to do some more in-person events. So even in the background image here, you can see we had a really great event with the visual development team from Marvel. It came out to our Lenovo stage on campus, and um, uh, all of the people present at that event got to see them present their artwork, but also ask them questions. And uh, every event at Noman is free to the public. So this is something you just simply are. RSVP for. You can follow us on social media to learn about upcoming events, uh, when and where they're being held, and so forth. Uh, and here's just a sampling of some of the types of events that we've done in the past. Uh, the last thing I'll mention um, in the way of events is that Noman is also interested in visiting your classroom. So if you are a high school student or a community college student and you would love uh, for Noman to come and visit your art class and share with you about these types of careers, 
um, and connect with uh, other students in your classroom. If you're an educator that would like that to happen, you can also mention that on the contact form that Xander is filling out. We would love the opportunity to provide an interactive experience in your classroom. You can see here on the right on the right side here, we're utilizing a uh, cloud-based software called Magma, which is a little bit like drawing collaboratively and collaboratively in Photoshop online together. So uh, we we have the option to do those kind of things together when we present virtually to your classroom as well. So with that being said, guys, I want to say thank you so much for tuning into the stream today. Uh, I want to encourage you if this is something you're interested in, or maybe you just feel like I don't even I don't know. I feel like I need to know more about this. Our advisors are ready and waiting for you uh, to be helpful to you and help you accomplish the goals that you have um, and what you want to get out of art and what you want to pursue. So stay safe, everyone. Uh, stay creative. And we'll see you back here uh, for the next live stream, which is going to be uh, next week on Wednesday our weekly art jam with Josh Herman, Noman's uh, chief creative creative officer. He's going to be working in ZBrush. Uh, I know, I think last week he is, had, did some custom D&D &D dice in ZBrush. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to tune into that. It's going to be on Wednesday from 2 to 5 uh, Pacific Daylight Time. And uh, we'll see you back here again. Goodbye.